and that takes us straight into item six, which is COVID-19 disease response, departmental briefing on surge planning. So I want to advise members that the Minister and the Chief Medical Officer are joining us by Skype to discuss the surge plan and latest developments. We have reordered the agenda to accommodate the Minister's urgent dairy commitments and I want to just at this point welcome the Minister, Robin Swan, and Chief Medical Officer Michael McBride. Thank you for being here today via Skype, gentlemen. Um, Thank you, Chair. I refer members to papers at tab six of the pack and tab six of table papers, which includes yesterday's letter from Community Pharmacy NI and the Minister's announcements regarding primary care COVID-19 centres, pharmacy funding and car parking charges for HSC workers. There's also a briefing note on PPE and testing provided by RAISE. So again, I want to welcome the Minister and Dr Michael McBride to um, our meeting today and invite the Minister and the Chief Medical Officer to brief us at this time and then we'll ask you some questions. Thank you. Um, yeah. First of all, can I thank you for your comments on opening the committee, um, especially in regards to the condolences and support to those who have lost their lives. And I think you are right um, in regards to the frequency and the seriousness um, that such announcements will be made. But your guidance and your opening words in regards to asking people to be responsible by taking their, their actions and how they can actually then the further spread of COVID nineteen are, are well made and one some that can't be rehearsed often enough. Um, the, the title of the title of this uh, I think presentation is actually to talk about our storage plan. Uh, we launched that uh, about a fortnight ago into where we thought we would be moving between the middle of March to the middle of April. At that point I made it clear that uh, this would be a live document. So look, there's things in this this search plan that have moved on, we've developed, we've delivered, and we're now looking at the further further iterations. Um, in regards to some of the points that, that, that were covered, um, I visited our first COVID-19 centre uh, that was opened in Alton Galvin yesterday. It's a, it's a new and new and me and a New, new approach uh, as to how we're actually going to support um, patients of COVID-19. It's been developed by co-production through GPs, Health and Social Care Trust, Western Trust, uh, Pharmacy. It's, um, it's, it's the National Health Service working at its best together. What will actually enable is people with COVID, COVID symptoms, when, when they can contact their GP initially, if they can't be triaged and the symptoms are, are low enough that self-isolation work, they can do that. If they're severe enough, they will still be taken to hospital. But if they're not mid-range, these COVID-19 centres will allow people to present, be checked by a GP, have access to medication there and then, and also then be triaged either recommendation to go home or straight into hospital. I would emphasise that the Chief Medical Officer said yesterday in the, in the media brief, they're, they're not testing centres. Um, but look, uh, as our testing capacity increases, there, there may be an opportunity for using the MADNAT. And a number of, of other concerns I think that has been raised was in regards to, to PPE. Um, we released it at the beginning of the week 30% uh, of our pandemic stock, which will make up a large or, or, or fill a large gap that we had in, in, in our flow. We've, we've also made, made a number of changes as to how PPE is managed across the health and social care system. Previously, it was, it was ordered at ward level. We've now brought in one, uh, one point of contact in each trust, so that can be managed and coordinated. Um, at this moment in time, we're, we're seeing and hearing concerns that are being raised by the social and domiciliary care workers um, who previously would have sourced their own PPE, um, but would have sought backup uh, stocks from, from the trusts. Uh, th there is a pinch point in supply there, 
it's something that we're alive to. It's something we're working very, very strenuously to, 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 to solve in that supply chain. But it's also, sorry, I've just had a note. Um, can you just mute me here, because I'm getting feedback here. I'm, I'm hearing myself talking to me. Okay, appreciate that. Uh, just in, re in regards to, to that PPE, um, what we're trying to address is the concern, and it's a genuine concern of those working in our service, that they don't have the correct PPE or access to the stuff. At this minute in time, our supply chain and our stock is such that it is there, it is available. We do have to work a bit harder in making sure it's in the right place at the right time. But what we're doing as well is reinforcing to people of the usage of PPE to use the right grade at the right time in the right circumstance. And we're being guided by this uh, through WHO guidance on PPE in regards to COVID-19. Um, we've put out a number of guidance uh, and support documentation through through our entire sector, through domiciliary care, through our home care, our, our, our care home providers as well. Um, we're reinforcing that. We've put it out again. Our chief nurse is doing a number of educational videos as to how to wear PPE, what's the right point to use it, and when to use it. Um, that guidance is in place. I, I've shared it with executive colleagues this, this morning before coming on to, to meet yourselves. I'll share that with you now. So if we can get that information out, it'll, it'll help to, I think, alleviate concerns that people, people have. Uh, because they are genuine fears. But I, I, everyone in Northern Ireland is apprehensive to some level as to where this goes at this moment in time, and, and rightly so. Um, so that, that's where we are in PPE. Sorry, Chair, had you anything else? Um, I suppose, and, well, we can just go straight to questions if, if you wish, unless... I, unless... Yeah, look, I, look, we're worried we're enough in this myself and the Chief Medical Officer here thought it would be, be better if we actually came and answered questions from yourself um, rather than putting in officials. Um, so, fire away. Okay, thank you. So, um, I suppose I'll, I'll start with testing, Minister. I mean, we know that um, the testing is being ramped up um, and that uh, hopefully we'll get to around 1,100 per day soon. There is um, a lot of concern that, that that still isn't enough and that frontline health workers and also key workers need to be able to access testing. And we've seen uh, in terms of um, community pharmacy, uh, advice as of Tuesday that 30% of pharmacy workforce were in self-isolation and that the sector was close to collapse. So we obviously have many people who are concerned that either they're not protecting themselves or not protecting others in their very key, very vital workplace. Um, that is a big concern. And I've also had, uh, well, there was a, a Belfast Telegraph article around PSNI officers being told that they had to work on, even though they knew they had come into contact with um, possible COVID-19 cases and uh, they don't have PPE. So it's just some guidance on on all of those things would be appreciated just to start off with. Right, I, I have I haven't haven't sight of the the PFNI um, article, but I'll certainly follow that up with the with the Minister of Justice and see what we need to see what we need to do there. In regards to your ramping up of, of testing, that um, you know, in January there was no test for COVID nineteen. Uh, the scientific word moved very fast to get that capacity and that test built up. Uh, here locally, we've moved to 600. As you said, Chair, we intend to move to 1100 by early next week. Some of that will be based on trust. Um, we're also working with Public Health England 
as part of a national procurement on commercial testing. And as soon as we've sort of completed the evaluation of those tests, we'll, we'll see how that, that rolls out. That is, is, a key, is a key we want to use. Again, it's another tool um, that, that we have to have to use. But the tests are, are based on a number of key areas and where we utilise our, our current capacity. The first are for those who are in hospital um, with other or underlying medical conditions. Uh, and present with COVID-19 because we need to identify those people who are in our health and social care system so they can receive the best treatment that they, we can provide. The, the second group are those who are in clustered or um, gripping um, accommodation. So old people's homes, prisons, um, those, those centres for special educational needs, um, so that if there's somebody that identifies in there, we can get that cluster tested to make sure it doesn't become a, a larger a larger area. Uh, the third group and then is our health and social care workers because it's, it's vital that we get them back to to work as soon as possible to support support those key individuals. Um, so that that group that group does include a, a number of key workers. It includes uh, PHE. When I met community pharmacy on Tuesday, uh, they raised the same issue with me, and look, they're part of the healthcare family. And that's what I told them, and that's the commitment I gave them. So, so there they will be part of that process as we run by your testing, because the, the only way we tackle this is by is by working together. Um, I'll just ask the chief medical officer to come in if he wants to. Yeah, I, 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 I'm chair, deputy chair, minister, thank you, uh, members, uh, I'll be sure they, I can summarise the presentation. Um, I think we need to. Uh, Sorry to interrupt yeah. you. Uh, just to say that we've checked at this end that nothing can be done at our end about the sound quality. So if somebody wants to check at the minister's end if something can be done about the sound quality, but also you are very faint. I understand your distance from the minister unless you want to swap. I'm do so. Thank you. Uh, just to say that. I think it's important that we keep all in mind that this is a virus that, as of the 10th of December of last year, we didn't know existed. It hadn't made the jump from uh, from bats through perhaps a mammalian host into humans. Uh, we are now in a situation as where next week we will be testing in excess of 1,100 um, a day, and with with plans to ramp that up. At a national level, uh, over coming days and weeks, the ministers indicated uh, there are ongoing discussions with a range of partners, commercial partners, to make those tests available. What we need to be absolutely certain is the verification, validation, and quality control of those tests, um, and also to ensure that we're prioritising those uses, as the minister said, first and foremost, for uh, to guide clinical decision making for those who are sick and ill. Uh, to investigate and manage outbreaks, and also to ensure that we get our frontline healthcare workers and, in due course, other uh, critical uh, workers back into the workplace as quickly as is possible. We cannot uh, test where we do not have test capacity uh, at present. Our proportion of tests are equivalent to any part of these islands in terms of the numbers of tests that we're doing per head of the population and also the turnaround time. Uh, equally, it's no point conducting a test, taking a sample, and people waiting for weeks for the result. Uh, that defeats the purpose. Um, we need to be clear that as we move through different phases of this, this uh, epidemic pandemic, as testing comes online, we will use our testing in different ways. Um, so, for instance, if indeed the social distancing, which is so, so important, if people follow that advice, the modelling suggests that we will ever be able to pull down the peak and our health services should be able to cope. If that is the case, and as testing ramps up, then we can begin to use our testing capacity in different ways. And we've had discussions about community testing and making that more widely available. I would just also want to add, finally, before concluding, that we are seeing new tests come online. 
very rapidly, which include tests for the virus itself, the so-called antigen tests, but also very importantly, antibody tests. Those are tests which will tell us what proportion of the population have had the virus, may have had a very mild illness, or may not have had any symptoms at all, but have actually developed immunity to it. And that's crucially important because if we can begin to test critical uh, frontline staff across all sectors and determine that already a high proportion of them have immunity uh, to the virus, then they are safe to go back into the workplace uh, and safe to work with uh, patients and other members of the public. So I think over the next couple of weeks, we will see a step change, uh, not only in our testing here in Northern Ireland, our capacity, but also at a UK level. Um, uh, thank you. And can can I don't know whether you, Michael, or the minister would want to update us on the expert testing advisory group? Yes, the the minister has announced uh, from uh, last week that we were establishing an expert advisory group that comprises uh, scientists, virologists, um, expert um, uh, clinicians here in Northern Ireland, working with their counterparts uh, in Public Health England. Again, accessing all of the evaluation of the currently available commercial tests and those coming online. And then uh, that expert advice will be providing advice to myself and then to the Minister about the suitability of those tests. But as Minister said, I think it's important that uh, to emphasise that we are taking a UK approach to this because clearly our combined uh, Efforts is crucially important at a time like this, as the, uh, as the deputy chair has mentioned. We're also very working very, very closely uh, with our colleagues in the Republic of Ireland uh, as well. Okay, thank you. We're just going to move to um, questions. Is it for Michael or for the minister? Um, <clears throat> either. Uh, I, I think the. We're going to go straight to the chair, who's um, working remotely. So the, the the clerk is going to read his questions. Right, so, uh, so this question is from Colm and the clerk is reading it off. To ask the Minister or the Chief Medical Officer how many testing centres are being put in place, where they'll be located and when they'll be operational. Second question, uh, could he assure the committee that areas west of the ban will be sufficiently provisioned and that historic underinvestment will not be compounded in the crisis? by basing current plans too rigidly on existing services? Uh, in regards to the second question, yes, we will be, testing will be done equitably across Northern Ireland as and where we see, see the need. And in regards to the first, we're, we're not at a point where we're going to open those, I, I suppose, community testing sites. Where, we're, where our focus is at this minute in time is on our COVID-19 centres. So we're getting that frontline support to those people who are presenting with that mid-range uh, symptom of COVID-19. So as, as to move for, for, the, for the, the, the community test, we're not on that stage yet because we, we still don't have that capacity. Okay, we're just checking for any more questions from Colin before we... Um, yeah. Did, did, did the minister answer the west of the ban question? He sort of did at the start there. He says it's going to be testing across Northern okay. Ireland. Okay. Right. So the next question. Uh, well, there's, there, 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 there's, no, there's no geographic disparity in any service that I provide. Uh, the second test is a comment on the question. Uh, the chair refers to the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control and their uh, multiple rapid risk assessment for COVID 19. The most recent, he says, is from the 25th of March and states, quotes, shortages in testing capacity need to be anticipated and addressed, taking the needs for testing of other <coughs> critical diseases into account. If capacity is exceeded, priority should be given to the testing of vulnerable patients, healthcare workers and patients requiring hospitalisation. So the question is, are you aware of the ECDC publications and would you agree with their assessment on testing? If so, what capacity would we need per day to meet those ECDC recommendations uh, if they're prioritised? Sorry, those ECDC guidance are, are, are the, the, the recommendations and guidance that we work through. As we said at the start, that there are, our criteria for testing is those who are, in who are being hospitalised, 
and present with a medical condition. We test, we test every one you know, of those people in hospital to make sure we can treat patients with COVID-19 as a priority, but also make sure those who don't are not in the same vicinity that they will pick up infection. So we're actually meeting that EC, ECDC guidance. Uh, we actually go a step further, then we go into the clustering, and then we go into our, our own healthcare professionals. So, so we're in, we're in line and in tune with that. In regards to capacity, we are increasing our capacity, or, or which will meet the the conditions that we've laid down in the specifications uh, of groups that we are actually testing at this moment in time, because we want to go further. Uh, just to, just to add, add to that, that obviously ministers across the United Kingdom uh, are advised by respective chief medical officers. We are working very closely together. We have the benefit of some of the best scientists and clinicians uh, in the uh, in these islands. We have also the benefit of the scientific advisory group on emergencies, which is looking at all the modelling evidence, all of the science, and we have the combined. Uh, resources of the Public Health England, our Public Health Agency uh, in Northern Ireland, Health Protection Scotland and uh, Public Health Wales. And on the basis of that has informed our approach uh, to testing, that has informed our approach to containment, which has been successful and delayed the spread of this virus, the delay phase and all of the work that we're un undertaking. Um, what you've outlined in terms of ECDC uh, surveillance uh, and update on, on testing is now it seems very closely aligned with what we've been doing for quite some time. Okay. To move on to some of the members' questions, Alex. Yeah. Thank you, Minister. Um, I want to say thank you about the car parking charges for staff that you lifted. So well done for that. Um, in terms of protection gear, I have had a few complaints from staff from sort of like the private sector that uh, nursing homes are not supplying the gear as quick as they could or or not as what they're being recommended. Um, is, is somebody keeping a close eye on the private sector uh, nursing homes and stuff like that to try and make sure that they're, they're following suit? Yeah, and I think Alex, as I said, I said in my open comments, that there seems to be a, a supply uh, delay in regards to our trust into the independent sector. It's something we're alive to, something we're working on to address, um, just to make sure we get that flow. But it's also critical that everyone across the sector is using the appropriate PPE at the correct time. So we've re-emphasised and reissued that guidance as to what is the appropriate PPE to use in situation. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll share that with the committee so you, you can have access to it. And we are following WHO, World Health Organization guidance, on what is the appropriate PPE to use in the correct circumstance. And, and that guidance has been developed by the WHO in response to how different countries have reacted to COVID-19 and what they see as needs be, being necessary. So this is actually evidence-led um, from the WHO professionals. Uh, but I, I think the important thing is, is for those independent care sectors to make sure they not just don't have the PPE, but they also have the reassurance and the guidance that they're using the correct PPE in the right situation and at the right time. Um, next. Oh, you want then, Michael? No. Good. Oh, right. Okay. I thought you were waving at me. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> the next question is. Um, do the public health agency have a role in making sure that those companies that are working are keeping to the rules in terms of making sure that staff are two metres apart? Because I'm, I'm get, getting quite a few complaints about that as well. About uh, thanks, Minister. Um, there is... Um, Public Health Agency has produced guidance, which is on their website. The guidance is quite clear uh, that, um, where possible, individuals should be working from home. Where that is not possible, the general rules around social distancing and hand hygiene need to be, uh, need to be followed. Uh, obviously, companies need to be uh, creative 
in the current circumstances as to how they apply those, and the competitively at shift patterns, rota patterns, and just moving perhaps on uh, production lines, etc. But we also need to see this in the, in the broader context. Um, the Deputy First Minister, First Minister and Deputy First Minister have issued a clear uh, advice on this in terms of their expectations, in terms of non-essential uh, work uh, proceeding. I think it's also important that we see this in the longer term. Uh, unfortunately, as the Deputy Chair mentioned uh, earlier, uh, we have sadly seen, seen loss of life. We are going to see in the coming weeks numbers of deaths increase, and the rate of those deaths increase as well. Um, and that is a significant loss. Our priority throughout all of this is to, to reduce mortality, both direct mortality from the virus itself, but indirect mortality because our health service is overwhelmed. And that's why, as the uh, Deputy Chair emphasised at the outset, the importance of the message of stay at home, avoid unnecessary travel, uh, and to adhere to the rules around uh, social distancing. But we also need to remember that poverty kills people too. And that's why it's important that we maintain the balance between ensuring that any impact on our wider economy in the longer term does not significantly disadvantage those who are often already most socioeconomically disadvantaged uh, so there is a balance here. Nothing trumps the saving a life, and that's why adhering to the public health agency's advice to employers and social distancing, and our general advice to the public is so important, because that will pull down the peak. Uh, it will protect our health service and allow us to provide optimum care. But we also need to um, be clear that in the medium to longer term, that we need to ensure that what we don't do is collapse the economy and end up with those in the most socioeconomic deprived areas uh, suffering the consequences. We know the very strong links that we have to a number of physical uh, issues and health issues, but also uh, longer term mental health issues. Um, and to say any steps that we take around social distancing are likely to be put in place for quite some time and we need to think about the sustainability of that. Thank you. Um, just another two quickies. <laughs> um, we're talking about um, testing kits, um, and there was stuff on the news the other night about there are different testing kits. They're, they're not saying that you've got the illness right now, it's that you've actually had it. Um, is there any plans for those to be coming here or, or to be made available in some way? Or do, or do we know anything about that? We do. That is one of the things that is one of the things the expert group in testing is actually looking at. Um, so what, when that national contract comes online, we'll be, we'll be part of it. But one thing that I, I suppose is important to stress about testing, and especially that antigen testing, um, we can't stress enough that being tested and have a certificate that you have been tested is not a certificate of immunity. Because there's a real danger there if somebody comes through, you know, has a test. I'm you no, know, it's like an MOT. You could be tested at four o'clock this afternoon and not have COVID 19. By five o'clock, you could have it. So a test does not give you immunity from, from this, this virus. Last. Thing, um, have you any numbers on volunteers that have contacted you about helping out? Uh, in regards to, to, to volunteers, that's been handled by the Department of Communities. Um, I think they're actually working in conjunction with the, with the Red Cross. Um, one of the things that our trust has, our trusts across Northern Ireland, is that they, they have a good body of volunteers uh, that they can draw on, but we're supplementing that by by what the Department of Community has drawn in through their online their online call that's been done through the executive office. Where we will see a need for, for those volunteers stepping up, and it's a you know it's a call I'll put out to sporting clubs, to voluntary organizations, um, to churches. Um, when we issue the letter to the 40, 40, 000 odd people that could be asking to shield themselves, 
they will need assistance. They'll need assistance with food delivery. They'll need assistance with people collection prescription for them from pharmacy, because we're very conscious of the pressure that it could put in community pharmacy of an expectation of delivery. That, that's not what is envisaged here. It's about those people who are shielding where they can, when they can, to ask friends, family, uh, neighbours and community organisations actually to support them while they're shielding. Because what we have to be very clear in, in our messaging to these people that we're asking to shield, we don't want them to be isolated from the community. We want them to be shielded from the virus. A very good point. And just on, on the back of that, can you be very clear about where people, because there are so many people who want to volunteer in so many different ways, where do they go to? And will the Department of Communities then be setting up um, uh, uh, like a helpline, such as that we see, the, like the NHS helpline in England? Will that be set up through Department of Communities um, in line with or in cooperation with a, a big charity such as Red Cross to ensure that? That we actually collate all that, all, all those offers of help, and that that that, that help is um, is made the best of, and and also, um, we've heard this morning in terms of ventilators that Dyson are are going to make a very large number of, of ventilators, um, and I I'm just wondering, are any of those ventilators um, earmarked to come to Northern Ireland? Again, sorry, I'll go. go. Um, in regards to the ventilators and Dyson, um, we're, we're part of, there's a UK supply, we're part of the UK, so we get our, our proportion as, as is necessary to that. We have 650 ventilators currently on their way at, at less than a minute in time, so those have already been ordered. Um, 100 mechanical ventilators, 350 non-invasive and 3 airvo. Um, so those are on stage and our procurement along the CPD. Uh, and the Department of Finance are um, looking on purchasing ventilators. But it's not just about buying the machine. It's making sure we have the people who can operate them and actually utilise them so they produce uh, the correct support that the patient needs at that minute, minute in time. In regards to where people uh, volunteer and the connection they made, the First Minister uh, launched the website in a, a connection yesterday afternoon. Um, I, I don't have the detail just in front of me, Deputy Chair, but I'll get it to you. Okay, thank you. And um, the last one from me for now is about um, a call from, we heard it in the media this morning, but a lot of people in different areas of work life who are wanting to donate what they have in terms of PPE. And, you know, is it, would that be useful? And would there be drop-off points that can be um, identify that people can actually donate what they have. Maybe people who are, who are not able to work at the moment, say for instance a beautician who wants to donate her gloves or hairdressers who want to donate their gloves to other uh, key workers who could make good use of those. And also there was a call for, I think from nurses, who were calling for baby monitors if people were finished with them. Um, that would be another thing that would be great if that was useful too those nurses and carrying out this, their, their vital work, if there could be a drop-off point that people could actually help to provide those baby monitors to the health service workers? I saw that call tonight myself this morning, Vice Chair. Um, we're working on to how best utilise uh, that information, but we also have to, uh, or that offer of supply of, of equipment. But we need to be sure uh, of the validity of the supply chain of it as well, and that it, anything that comes to us to be used has been properly sanitised, that there's no risk of infection or cross-contamination from where where it has been before. So where, where those offers are very, very welcome, we have to make sure that they're not also adding an additional layer of concern um, to those who are using them or those who make, make use of them. So it's something, something that became aware of at half eight this morning and something we're looking at. Okay, and you'll you'll come back to us on that, I'm sure. I'm uh, sure. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair, sorry, can I, can I just indicate, um, we had an hour with you this morning, so half 11, I have an executive meeting following this. Okay, all right, we'll move on to Jerry. 
Uh, thanks, Minister uh, Chief Medical Officer. Can you hear me okay? Yeah? Yeah. Yep, thanks. Uh, so I'll be quick. A um, couple of quick points. Uh, PPE. Um, I'm being contacted by a lot of people um, about the lack of or non-existence of, of PPE. I'm sure they're members of the same. Uh, care workers, you don't have any. Uh, people in hospices, you don't have any or it's, very, it's running low. People who uh, produce food, uh, who are at the, basically at the end of uh, masks and other equipment. So that, that's very concerning. I want to ask, is there a plan to ensure more is uh, um, spread out and given uh, to people? Um, testing as well. Um, I think I heard you correct, Minister, the COVID centres don't provide testing, if I picked you up correctly there. I mean, is there a plan to introduce drive-in testing centres? I think there's at least 61 in the south at the minute, so I think we're, we're way behind uh, on that, and we need to rapidly increase testing, generally speaking, but um, drive-in testing centres is a quick and one of the safest ways of um, making it happen, so what is the plan, if any, on, on that? Um, just two final quick points. Um, uh, ventilators, I'm concerned we don't have enough ventilators. Um, we have one for every 10,000 people here. Uh, in the US, we have one for every 3,700 people. And obviously, if you see the scenes in New York, you know um, America is ill-equipped uh, for all sorts of reasons to, to deal with this crisis. So I'm concerned that we don't have enough ventilators. Uh, there's a company in the south of Ireland that creates a lot of them. Um, and I raised this uh, in the chamber the other day. Is there a plan to requisition, take over to uh, get a, a bigger increase uh, of ventilators. That would be something that I would be very, very keen uh, to see happen. And finally, I know there's uh, rules around student nurses. Um, I think it's six months. If you if you have your, if your course is finished in six months, uh, you can essentially work in the health <coughs> service and support people, as far as I understand. Uh, there's people that have contacted me who have nine months or ten months left uh, in terms of their, their course. Is there, you know, we want to make sure people are, are sort of well trained and well equipped uh, to, to work in the health service um, if they're able to, but is there a plan to sort of slightly relax that six months to extend it out because it might uh, bring in an extra couple of hundred or at least a couple of thousand nurses? Um, so appreciate answers on that. No, um, Gary, yeah. I, I'll touch on some of them and ask the Chief Medical Officer just to come in. In regards to the people who I said earlier on, we're working hard to make sure that people understand the PPE they need at the correct place in time. We are seeing a pressure point in the supply chain between our trusts and some of the private care home providers and some of the private domiciliary care providers. We're working to address that. Uh, that's why I relief uh, the 30% of our pandemic stuff to make sure that flow was there. We're also making sure that that's been supplemented by, by purchasing from across, across the world as we see supply chains, even in China, starting to open, open up again. Um, and again, we're part, we're part of the UK, the UK purchasing bar. Uh, in regards to, to ventilators, we are out across, we're out across the world. We're looking everywhere to get the ventilators that, that we need, but also to make sure that we have the people um, who can use them. So that's why in the, in the surge plan, and you're starting to see some of, some of our elective care and probably more so in, in the coming days actually starting to turn down some of those procedures so we can profile areas and train up people so when we need them to be in that critical care situation that they have the, the skills to do that. In regards to the nursing students, we brought our nursing students forward that six months so they could still be um, at the stage in their training where they, they can be utilised on wards safely with supervision. Uh, we haven't, and I, I don't think uh, at this minute in time we're looking to relax that below the six months. Um, but at some point, if it's necessary, we will look at that. Uh, in regards to, the, to those students, you know, if they want to volunteer in, in any situation, we will support them and look to how we can best utilize them to do that. Uh, it is correct, we don't, we're, we're not able to use the COVID centres for testing at this minute in time because of the capacity, but it's something that we we intend we intend looking at. The drive-in centres is not something we've explored uh, because of the capacity we currently have, but if, if needs must and we get the opportunity to do it, we'll look at how we can do it in the community. It might not be drive-in, but yes, we may look at another function. Yeah. Just uh, thank you. Thank you, Minister. Um, 
Right, just to say that you know, in terms of testing, the safest thing to do now is follow the advice. And the advice is that in symptoms to self-isolate, household isolation, social distancing, testing won't beat this virus. Testing is not a magic bullet. What we need to do is to follow the public health advice which is out there around self-isolation, household isolation, social distancing, hand hygiene. That's how we will beat this virus and pull down the poop so our health service will cope. Where we need to prioritize, uh, prioritize testing, and I, I repeat this, has to be in managing people who are sick. Those who have got pneumonia in our hospitals, those who are in intensive care, ensuring that from an infection prevention control perspective, that, that we prevent spread and outbreaks within our hospitals. That's crucially important. That has to be our priority. Our next priority has to be getting frontline health and social care workers back into work to maintain services. That is our priority. When we get to the next phase of this, uh, of this pandemic, if indeed people adhere to the very important message the Deputy Chair mentioned at the outset around social distancing, we will see the re reproductive value. That's the number of people that are infected for, for each person that is infected fall below one. That's, that's our aim, is to pull that down from currently about two and a half to below one. If we can achieve that, then we will get a handle on this. Our health service will be able to cope. And as we ramp up our testing capacity, then we can begin to use our testing in different ways, including some of the approaches uh, that you have suggested. And we'll have to think through very carefully uh, how we do that, where we do that. But as I say, our priority at this time must be on preparing our health services to deal with the pressures, treating the sick and managing them, and ensuring that we get our frontline staff back into work uh, for those who are currently self-isolating at home with family. We have uh, introduced uh, a protocol for testing of staff. We are currently set, setting, testing staff. As we said, in coming weeks, that will rapidly uh, escalate in terms of our capacity uh, to do that. We're absolutely committed to upping our testing capability and using it appropriately at different uh, phases of this pandemic. Just in relation to ventilators, uh, just to reassure you, as Minister said already, we're plugged into UK wide, wide procurement and our business service organization, with colleagues in the Republic of Ireland is also plugged into uh, the company in Galway that you referred to. Uh, in terms of nursing students, our chief nursing officer is also engaged with universities around second year uh, nursing students who obviously have um, less experience and training, but nonetheless, as Minister has said, uh, can volunteer in certain roles uh, to provide uh, support, uh, supportive care. Um, we have Colin, Alan and Paula all indicating that they want to ask questions and we are aware that we are running out of time. Minister, can I just ask at this point, would it be possible, and we don't want to burden you any more than you already are, but we have many, many questions. Would there be any way that we could collate questions um, amongst this committee um, and ask if we could send them through to you, even for, even through, uh, for a written answer, or if, if somebody else from the department could even come back next week and brief us or answer some of our questions because they're very important questions we understand we've no other way to ask these questions um, and it's just a difficult time so um uh, chair chair look possibly if it's helpful if you, if you could get those questions um i'll come back for an hour next week again that would be good if you can get those questions to us it means we, we can Look, I have to be. I have to be. I'll, I'll be frank. I'll be honest with you. Um, in regards to the questions that come through, they may change. The answers may have changed by the time you ask them and we get them to you. So, I have to be conscious of the usage of time of my staff. But if if, if, if we can get a, as a big a head up to the, the questions that we can, and if you can keep them to a minimum, chair, I would appreciate that as well. Thank you. Appreciate that, Colin. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Minister and Chief Medical Officer, and I echo the condolences. 
that you uh, passed earlier to the families of the bereaved. Uh, and also just to extend thanks to the whole healthcare family who are working exceptionally hard at this time, and that's very, very welcome. Just a, a couple of points which I'll roll into one. Um, I'm going to say the PPE, 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 because, Minister, it, the inboxes are full, and I feel that somehow or another, as MLAs, we are like sal uh, the meat in a sandwich. Um, the executive is telling us that the stuff is there, but the people on the ground are telling us that it's not. So I think it's important if we can keep that communication open so that the people on the ground that are at the coal face get the services that they need. But they are telling us in large numbers at the minute that they're not. Um, and I don't uh, discount the word that you're saying that it's there, but we just need to iron that out because there is an anomaly and it's very, very important. There is evidence from testing that's been done in Germany that has kept the numbers down low. So I would just keep saying if we can ramp up the testing, if we know who has the illness, then we can isolate them and stop the further spread of it. Um, I think to just simply be one of the very few countries in the world that's not going down the line of testing is a bit worrying, and I mean that across the whole of the UK. Um, there's some worrying uh, uh, remarks this morning that uh, in the UK we're not recording deaths um, as they are in the rest of the world. Um, I understand that it's only when the families say that it's okay for the information to be released um, now, I was just wondering if that's definitely not the case here, because that's going to skew statistics and that could be uh, lead to a lack of trust. So I'd love to know just that definitely here in Northern Ireland, if there is a death related to the COVID, that it is released and that it's not withheld. And then um, finally, um, I, I, I did ask the Deputy First Minister, I did ask yourself, so I'm going to go for a third time. If there is service reconfiguration, can we please have an assurance that it's temporary and that after we get through this, which we will, that we'll be able to return the health service back to its former format? Thank you. Um, start up PPP, uh, I think I've covered that a number of times, Paul. I sort of should welcome you to the health committee for your first meeting. I, looking forward to your support. In regards to, to, to the testing, uh, being able to test people, see they're positive, and then tell them to self-isolate, we went a step further. We told anybody who was showing signs of a symptom or symptom of COVID-19 to self-isolate. And that was without having to go through the process of getting a test. So that's, that's how we reacted, and that's how, how we did that piece over the seven days. The seven days and the 14 days um, isolation was there to, to take the pressure off. So we, we took an additional step there. In, in regards to deaths being released and those numbers being released, um, there is no way in Northern Ireland for a family to, to not have it recognised on a death certificate. And that's where we, we work off, that's where we gather, gather our certificate. Where we have um, is not identified in the past as something that may identify a patient to the community where the family didn't want them to do. Uh, as the, the number of deaths was always recorded and displayed, but we didn't go down the line of saying who or where they were because out of the respect to the family, um, we respected those wishes. Chief. Uh, thank you. Uh, all of members are very welcome to the uh, committee. I um, appreciate this is a very difficult time for the committee, as it is for, for all of us. Uh, just to reassure you that there is a statutory uh, and legal obligation to report death. So, as Minister said, it is not something which there is within which there is discretion. Um, I think that it's important also to point out that the deaths that we will see in different parts of Europe, uh, different parts of the United Kingdom, different parts of the Republic of Ireland will be a function of a number of things. Where we have a higher percentage of older people, uh, or we have a higher percentage of people with underlying health conditions, then it is likely we will see greater numbers of deaths. I think that is some of the information and data that we're seeing coming from Italy, where the, the northern Italy in particular, where they have a large number of older people, many with long, uh, long term and their uh, conditions. Um, it's also important to say that in Northern Ireland, we probably also uh, have statistically a higher portion of older people than other parts of the UK. But let me just say this, that most people, irrespective of age, will make a full recovery from this. 
And I think that's important in the middle of all of this, at all of the concern and public anxiety, which is understandable, that as the chair mentioned at the outset, that for most people, this will be a mild to moderate illness, irrespective of age. And the vast majority of people will make a full, uh, a full recovery. In terms of the reference to Germany, how a virus behaves when it enters a certain different uh, population in a different country depends on the population that it initially infects. Some of the emerging data from uh, Germany suggests it was perhaps a younger cohort of the population which may have been infected in the first instance. And we just need to really see how the virus becomes established in Germany as to how that manifests in the in the weeks ahead. But just to say that we have taken an ultra precautionary approach. Even before testing, we have said anyone who has symptoms, recognising that many people who are self-isolating at the moment and many households that are isolating will not have COVID-19. So we've taken an ultra-cautious approach that says if you have any symptoms, such as a new continuous cough or fever, stay at home. And we've now combined that over our recent weeks. Ministers here uh, have agreed at the COVID calls to uh, increase the social distancing uh, to include closing bars and restaurants. Uh, and it's good to see we now have a common uh, approach to that across these, these islands. Um, and as I say, in the coming weeks, hopefully we'll begin to see the impact on that, not initially in the numbers of deaths, because don't forget that it'll take two to three weeks for those measures around social distancing to begin to have an impact. Sadly and tragically, the people who have died in recent days acquired their virus some many weeks ago. So we need to keep and hold our confidence that the social distancing measures that the Deputy Chair said at the outset are so vitally important because that will allow us to protect ourselves, protect each other and ultimately protect our health services so that those that need access to care can get the quality of care that they need when they need it. Third time I've asked that question and not had a response. I'll follow that up later. Right, no, I'll give you an answer. Good. Um, I don't know what the health service will look like in a week's time. I'll be perfectly blunt with you that. I don't know where we'll be. Our surge plans are in place to do what we have to do. That's why we're down to a number of procedures on the leg of surgeries that I would never have envisaged in my time that as a health minister, I would have to tell people they would not get. So to give any sort of commitment now that we will return 100% to where we were two months ago, I can't give it, and I won't give it, because I can't stand over it. I appreciate that, Minister. Thank you. Thank you. Minister, I'm not going to take any more of your time. I th really appreciate both your time. Well, Minister. I know you have still two members there. Look, if you just want to push another 10 or 15 minutes. I was, Minister, I was going to suggest, rather than uh, the members would probably have, I know Paula certainly has many questions, and I, what I would suggest, if you've committed to come back next week, that, that we would uh, prioritise those members first, to come in first with well, their questions. Well, if I get 10 minutes, look, I'm, I'm prepared to take Paula's priority questions or Alan's priority questions here now, so... One. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I, I welcome the uh, the realistic remarks from the chief medical officer there about the testing not being a magic uh, bullet, and I know there's uh, a lot of social media uh, medical experts are calling for more testing, uh, and in fact uh, enhanced uh, contact tracing. Uh, can you tell me is uh, I, I realise the value of contact uh, testing at the start of this outbreak when people were coming from overseas and carrying the the virus back in, but does there, uh, at this stage, uh, does there continue to be any value in contact uh, tracing? Uh, well, just to say, we have we have moved beyond the containment phase. This is, uh, and the, it was right to do that by a global pandemic. This virus is in every company in the world, uh, and it will be reintroduced again because of the movement that we have between countries. Our opportunity to contain this uh, virus in China passed a considerable time ago. We were successful uh, in containing the virus in, the, uh, in these islands, in the, in the United Kingdom and in the Republic of Ireland for a period. 
but we once we moved into uh, the place of sustained community transmission, then efforts to contain the spread of the virus were passed. We are now in the stage of trying to delay and minimize the impact on our health service. If we can pull down this peak again, reduce the rate of transmission, what we may then be able to do as testing capacity increases is, is move into another phase of trying to contain the virus through increased testing and contact tracing, but it isn't at this juncture. Our focus now must be in managing those people and providing the best care for those uh, who have been infected and at the same time continuing to press down on the peak by following the advice of self-isolation, household isolation and social distancing. As we get to a later phase, yes, um, there are other things which we will need to think about doing, including some of the things that we were doing in the earlier phase. We may need to think about also uh, relaxing some of the social distancing measures for a period. That might be possible. But the risk is, as we tend to relax those, there may be a re-emergence of the virus and we may need to introduce, but we need to bear in mind that we cannot maintain these uh, social distancing measures indefinitely. So again, there's modeling going on to examine what the impact of that might be, but our priority at the moment is to get that R value down to stop the virus transmitting as rapidly and as widely as it is at present. And that's why returning to the comments at the outset about the importance of social distancing and regular hand washing. So, uh, th thank you for that. Can I just ask one final quick question? And that's about those who may be asymptomatic. And, you know, obviously the advice given is to take as much caution as possible. Will that capture those individuals who may not actually show any symptoms or have any effect from the virus that they may be carrying? I'll let the Chief Medical Officer on. Uh, we, we have no evidence, and it would be contrary to other coronaviruses, that asymptomatic carriage of the virus will drive the pandemic. We know uh, from this virus and indeed other coronaviruses that people are most infectious at the time of onset of symptoms, and hence the importance of good respiratory hygiene and a good hand hygiene, and hence the very important messages around self-isolation and the precautionary approach to household isolation as well to ensure that we limit spread. Uh, so the, I suppose the, the simple answer is there's no evidence that individuals who carry this asymptomatically are going to be major drivers of spread of the infection. But it's a very important question because it may well be that many, many people, many more than we realize, have actually already been exposed to this virus and may have developed immunity. And that's why the question that was asked earlier by members around antibody tests are so crucially important. Because that means we can reassure uh, large numbers of our frontline health, front healthcare workers, other public sector workers, that they can go back and safely provide treatment, care and support and services. And actually, what it may also tell us is that the more true mortality from this virus is less than we currently think, because it may well be there are many, many more people infected that are actually presenting uh, or self-isolating at home, contacting their general practitioner, getting admitted to hospital, or, uh, or sadly, in some cases, uh, dying from, from the virus itself. Thank you very much. Um, I think that's. I think we'll let you go to your executive meeting, Minister, and just, re re just restate that uh, we do very much appreciate um, your being here remotely today, and look forward to speaking to you next week. And uh, wish you all the best for the week ahead. Thank you, Chair. And just again, can I thank the members of the committee for the support they are given? Because, uh, as I've said before. Don't underestimate um, when you thank the health service for what they do, just how much that means to our frontline workers. Should it be a painter, should it be a porter, a nurse, a surgeon, a community pharmacist, a GP? 
Um, every word of support comes out from, from the committee, from the MLAs, from individual. It means so much at this minute in time, Chair. So thank you very much for your support. Members, we're just going to take um, a quick break so we can set up the next Skype session and a quick comfort break. So we'll be.